Hello and welcome to P Guru's channel. I'm your host Sri Ayer. The new offensive that is happening from Turkey into portions of Syria uh, and, and Turkey trying to wipe out some of the Kurds there is not new. They have been at it for a long time. The Kurd or the Kurdistan concept where uh, a land comprising of the Kurds uh, who are 93% Sunni, Sunni. So they are also Sunni and so, so are the Turks. So it's a Sunni versus Sunni warfare. Now, the Kurdistan, the land that Kurdi could uh, dream of is something that stretches across, straddles three countries, Turkey, Syria, and Iraq. Now, ISIS was essentially based out of this town called Mosul and, and areas around that. And that was also a place where there was a lot of oil available and ISIS was able to use that oil to let its own you know, economy for some time until they got uh, kind of wiped out, but they're still there. Now, what has happened is the US peacekeeping troops who are maintaining peace in the Kurds area have actually withdrawn. And that is almost as if the spring has been, uh, you know, the pressure has been taken off. And now what we are seeing is the Turks have moved in and uh, they are causing mayhem. Now, what is happening is some rapid realignment of, you know, um, groups within Syria. To make sense of all this, we go to Abhijit Ayer Mitra. Abhijit, welcome to P Guru's channel. Thank you for having me. So Abhijit, maybe you can cast your glance back um, like after Saddam Hussein saga ended in Iraq. That's when Bashar Assad started, like under Obama, right? This whole thing started. Maybe you can kind of so, look, give us a quick- So look, it starts uh, in, yeah, okay. It starts in 2007. Right. When uh, this uh, drought basically starts uh, setting in. No, uh, or was it 2011? No, 2007 where the drought sets in. Now remember when you look drought at... Drought where? It's better to talk about... One second. It's, uh, it's best to look at this area as Mesopotamia, mm -hmm. which is Aleppo. It's a triangle. It's Aleppo, uh, Damascus, and Baghdad. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Three of the most important areas out there. Now, even though... Uh, Damascus and uh, Aleppo are on the Levantine coast and Baghdad is elsewhere. They've always been critical because all these three cities have always vied for dominance in what used to be that entire mess, the mm. fertile crescent, as you call it, which mm. ultimately includes Israel as well. Because mm. if you look at it, it's this circle. It goes mm. up with the Euphrates and Tigris and then mm. comes in on the Levantine coast. That mm. Levantine part is called Asham. Mm. So what happens here is, in the northern reaches, which is near Aleppo, a drought starts in about 2007 mm. and there's massive southwards migration. Mm. Now, if you look at the elites of Syria right now, they're the Damascene Alawite elites. It's, it's mm -hmm. the southern Damascene elites and Damascus basically won that sort of contestation with uh, Aleppo in those historical terms, so to say. So what happens is you have the northern rural people displaced because of the droughts, right. massive internal migration happening to the south. Right. That's the genesis of this conflict, resource deprivation, because mm. Bashar al-Assad was actually liberalizing the economy somewhat mm. uh, from that socialist pattern. So all these guys start moving south. The south gets overcrowded and you're seeing this uh, resource uh, constraint pattern. At the same time, that absolutely useless character Paul Bremer, the viceroy, the American viceroy in uh, yes. Iraq. Iraq. Has yes. He dismantled the Iraqi army completely. Yeah. So basically he dismantles the entire Ba'ath party. So you yes. have a whole set of people, doctors, physicians, lawyers, whatnot, thrown out of their jobs because membership of the Ba'ath party was made illegal. The Iraqi army, which was anyway a professional army, is made illegal and thrown out on the streets. You have all these people that are weaponized and trained that go out and that triggers off the Sunni insurgency. Now, what you're looking at is Sunni gripe because here, <coughs> it was uh, in Iraq, it was Sunnis ruling over a Shia simple majority. And Kurds too, yeah. In, right, right, in, yeah. Uh, but the Kurds are Sunni. Uh, in uh, Syria, there are uh, a minuscule minority called the Alawites 
ruling over a massive Sunni majority. So it's Sunni gripe meets Sunni gripe. Once this entire rebellion against America, there, there was no rebellion in the beginning. Till you put out these uh, Iraqi army and the Ba'ath party people out in the cold, there was no rebellion. This whole rebellion starts off. It then finds a new source of recruitment and discontent in the southern march of Sunnis, rural uh, Aleppo Sunnis to Damascus. And the whole thing becomes an absolutely toxic mix, right? Uh, and it's basically fighting the same enemy. Alawites are kind of seen, seen as Shia. Of course, the Shia don't consider the Alawites as Shia, but the Alawites consider themselves Shia. And Bashar so, Assad is? <coughs> is an Alawite. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you have a Shia versus Sunni dynamic that develops almost instantly. And because Saudi Arabia and Turkey hate Shias, they want to screw over the Shias, whatever, they start supporting this entire Sunni versus Shia thing. Erdogan anyway has a lot of links with a lot of shady Islamist organizations. The Saudis, I don't even need to get into their uh, shady organization linkages. And they immediately start helping things out. Now the trigger comes in 2011 where disaffection in Syria boils over. And it's put down with a heavy hand which then has its own action reaction cycle. But remember, it had been put down. This wouldn't have flared up into a civil war had Erdogan not perceived his opportunity. Now, if you look at the map of Syria, it's, right. think of it as a triangle like this, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what happens is one part of the triangle is chopped off. A part mm. of the Syrian coast is Turkish. Mm. As in Turkey comes south, almost like a peninsula jutting out into right, Syria. Right, right. And Syria claims that part saying, you know, you're illegally occupying this uh, area. And therefore, uh, Turkey has this interest in thwarting Syrian claims. Plus, it wants to get rid of the Kurds. So it makes this whole thing about, um, you know, going in to help freedom fighters because they realize if, you know, one of the things, this is what Pakistan also does in order to overcome Pashtun resistance and uh, Baloch resistance. They keep stressing Sunni, 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 that religion overcomes ethnicity. So they're trying to overcome the Arabic ethnicity of that particular southern province. They're trying to overcome the Kurd Kurdishness of Kurds by putting on the Sunni angle. <coughs> and in this case, it's easy because Turkey is essentially a Hanafi uh, country helping out Salafi organizations within Syria. So that's how this whole thing starts off. How it progresses now, there's too much microbalancing happening. Uh, mm. Syria with Saudi Arabia, well, not with Saudi Arabia, but Syria, uh, Saudi Arabia with Turkey, Saudi Arabia against Turkey, Turkey with Russia, Turkey against Russia, Turkey with Russia again, Turkey now not with Russia again, uh, Turkey coordinating, uh, Syria now with America, kind of in a sense, even though they hate Trump publicly, what Trump has done has basically helped the Syrians immensely because given a choice between Assad and Erdogan, the Kurds will choose Erdogan every day, uh, will choose Assad every day, day after day. There's no comparison, right? Why? Because the Kurds are also a minority, so they enjoy certain, there's that minority, minority affection between Alawites and Kurds in that sense. Not much. I mean, it's still been a violent history, but it's better than being part of, say, Turkey in their minds. So you, you were in 2011, and you said that uh, the dismantling by Paul Bremer caused a lot of disaffection and that sort of gave grist to the mill. But then you, I, I lost you somewhere there. After that, now, now, now it's 2019. Between then and now, there were some realignments and alignments and so on and so forth. Now, no, no, no. So, so Paul Bremer dismantles this sometime in what? Uh, 2008. Five, two, 2005, yeah. six, seven. Right, 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 right. Seven, right. seven is when the drought happens in northern Syria and the southward right. migration happens. Right. 2011 is when the whole thing boils up in Syria, that the resource constraints start boiling up in Syria, and that's when the civil war starts. Okay, so, uh, so let's, let's go forward after that. There was a time, when did the real migration to the West, that is to Europe and uh, you know, UK, start from uh, this area? I mean, that, that ended up including even Afghanistan, Afghanis and Pakistanis and even Bangladeshis. 
So basically what happens is, I don't know why it starts off exactly at a certain period of time. Uh, because most of what I've read are propaganda pieces, right? They say that Assad was killing, uh, Syrian troops are killing us. They never blame the Free Syrian Army for any of the massacres. They never blame the Free Syrian Army for using individuals as human shields, basically inviting uh, the Syrian Army to uh, bomb those civilians and so on and so forth. But in that entire phase between, say, 2013, 14 to about 16, is when the situation really, really gets inflamed when <coughs> just before the Russians come. The situation stabilizes when the Russians go in. Because once Russia comes in, it acts as, you know, the Israelis can't come hit you. The Americans can't come hit you, except with prior notification. Which is why when Trump carries out his uh, cruise missile strikes, he has to notify the Russians so that no Russians are killed. And then the cruise missile strikes happen, right? So just having Russia there makes everybody think twice. And that's when the, I wouldn't say the intensity of the fighting comes down. It's just that the population migration stops. Now, added to this, remember, a lot of this migration is just migration of opportunity. Right, right. There's a genuine humanitarian migration that happened not, in no. Syria. Mm. But a lot of it was Pakistanis and Afghans joining right. into this whole thing. I mean, right. a lot of them, almost what, 5 to 10% of them were Pakistanis, which, of course, nobody wants to talk about because it doesn't go with their narrative. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Moving into Europe. And, you know, what was amazing about that entire migration was that in security, we're always taught that one form of criminality leads to other forms of criminality because criminality is a psychological thing. If you're willing to play fast and loose with one rule or one law, you're willing to pay fast and loose with all laws and all rules. Right. Which is why, you know, the American nuclear establishment, they replace 2% of their staff every year. 2% of the staff are sacked every year. For what? Not for being lax in their nuclear duties. It's for things like accumulating too many parking tickets, accumulating too many speeding tickets, uh, bashing up your wife, something like that. Because the belief is that if you are accumulating speeding tickets, then at some point, you're also going to be careless with a set down procedure and in nuclear terms that can be devastating. Right. right. Now, this is what, now when, we, when I worked in security in America, what used to happen was at Sandia National Laboratories, we were forced to challenge each other. If you can't see somebody's security badge and you have never seen this person, security was everybody's responsibility, not just a, a guy at the gate. Yet, when you look at Europe, they are willing to accept a heavily radicalized population, a disaffected population that has been leveraged out to touts and pimps, immigration pimps and immigration touts, who are all linked to criminal nexuses, which means all these refugees are one way or another leveraged out into Europe. So that you now see high crime rates. Why is it even surprising? You know, all the scholarship that goes into security suddenly evaporates when it comes to immigration. Because again, one form of criminality leads to other forms of criminality. If they've used an illegal criminal network to come in, they are leveraged out and they are going, there is a high incidence of criminality that's going to result in the receiving country. And that's what we're seeing in Sweden at the moment. So what is the way out for the Western countries, uh, Western <coughs> Europe? There is no way out. This is what happens. Look, Western Europe in that sense is very much like India. In India, feelings are policy. We don't collect data properly. When we do collect data, we don't know how to translate it into policy. In Europe, they do collect a lot of data, but now data is politically incorrect. It's feelings and emotions that matter. It's sob stories that matter. It's that image of that Turkish uh, dead boy being washed, washed up on the beach that matter. Screw security, screw demographics, screw the uh, internal rift you're going to see, the horrific uh, sort of clash of civilizations within countries that you're going to see. They're brought into a lot of social turmoil. Best of luck to them. Also, there's a, there's a huge imbalance, isn't it? The number of people, immigrants going in, it's like 80 to 20 male to female, isn't it? Yeah, it's 80 to 20 male. Yeah. And you know, this is if, you, uh, if you're aware of things like the Tunisian, uh, uh, you know, the Arab Spring and things like that, 
there was a Stimson paper that linked it directly. They had actually, Stimson had predicted that Tunisia was one of the countries that were going to rebel in five years' time. They predicted the Arab Spring five years before the Arab Spring because of the demographic imbalance, that there was a male to female imbalance, that there was a job imbalance, that people weren't getting jobs. And this, you know, young men, young, you know, jab, Josh hota hai, uh, mm-hmm. Jawani ki Josh or whatever right, it's right. called in Hindi, right. is at your peak, you don't have jobs, there is social turmoil, you are going to see an uprising. Ditto in Syria. Syria was also Jawani ki Josh. It, it, it was a population, it was a demographic bulge of young people in between that was partially, I mean, nothing's ever monocausal, it's multi-causal, of course. But that is one of the things that led to this. So Europe is basically looking at a heavily radicalized population that has not accustomed itself to European norms because in Europe, the state had the monopoly on violence. Whereas the countries these guys have come from are essentially third world countries where the state was violent, but it did not have the monopoly on violence. There was high levels of societal violence. So violence is an acceptable form of social interaction. You know, it's like rural India where uh, if your daughter runs away with the guy, you will go kill your daughter and that guy. You know, it, it's almost like that. They haven't mentally adjusted to living in a first world country and yet they've been pushed into a first world country with this demographic issue, with all the economic problems that Europe is going through. You're looking at a social explosion waiting to happen. I don't see any positive outcome for Europe from any of this? Hmm. Well, uh, something to ponder over. And uh, okay, so la- last thing. Now, last couple of days, or la- I just just today, Trump is trying to walk back some of these things. He's going to keep some forces, and he's also, uh, you know, giving putting uh, some sanctions on Turkey. Uh, but already the massacres have started happening at uh, against the Kurds, right? I mean, they are killing them. Plus, many of the ISIS, those who are in prison, they have escaped. They don't know where they are. So, this genie cannot go back into the bottle, can it? Look, it's uh, th- this is kind of a desperate rare guard by Turkey. Uh, I personally, I'm not prone to conspiracy theories, but I personally think this was very carefully choreographed between Putin, Assad, and uh, uh, Trump. Oh, okay. uh, no, Trump, not Erdogan. Mm. I think mm. Erdogan is the bakra of this entire piece. Mm. Because what happens is, the moment America withdrew, right. the choice became clear to the Kurds what they wanted, Assad or Erdogan. And I told mm. you before that a choice between Assad and Erdogan. It's always Assad going to be every... more to Assad. Right, right, Assad. Right. And right. Uh, what's happened last night is they have signed that agreement with uh, Assad at midnight last night, they, well, midnight yes, Syria time, yes, they right. signed an agreement with Assad, yeah, which I means that. that the Syrian yeah. army is now going to help. The moment the Syrian army helps, of course, the Russians will extend their no-fly zone to any place where the Syrian army goes. Hmm. There's no way in hell that Turkey can attack those places again. Aren't Russia also friends with uh, Turkey? They also have, like, they supplied them S-400s and all that stuff. Yeah, now, but are they Turkey playing both rem- sides? But Everybody in this game is playing both sides because <laughs> you remember Turkey shot down two Russian planes. Yeah, and that's the, right. Uh, that's and, right. And the bodies and the bodies of those two Russian pilots were tortured and mutilated. One was found alive; he was tortured and killed. I think was it? Right, right, but right. I think so. Yeah. The kind of desecration of the body that they did, and I, I remember the video of one of those. It was absolutely disgusting. Mm. So, uh, and then they kiss and hug and make up. And now finally Putin screwed up Erdogan again because Erdogan thinks he's getting free reign. But how long is he going to support this militancy? Right. Uh, I, I think you're looking at the final stages of the Syrian civil war. Maximum there's going to be a mopping up operation for another year and a half, two years. And that's about it. But Assad has won. Full stop. I see. And, and have the population from Aleppo moved back? Has a drought seeded, subsided now? No, now the demographic issue is completely different because there's been such massive migration outside of Syria. Hmm. We really don't know because there's been no data collection that's happened out there. We don't know what the depopulation statistics are. Uh, We don't know how urban settlements are going to recalibrate to the loss of population. Because remember, it's, it's urban populations that moved out. 
Right. And it's really urban concentrations that determine the direction of any country. Mm. So let's see what happens out there. Um, I, I personally am not optimistic because this war has set back Syria to almost a hundred years in terms of human development. Uh, mm. And you know, there are also other things, for example, the criminalization of the economy, which is what happens when you're heavily sanctioned and uh, right. a war economy, the conflictization of the economy, uh, lots of things that, that are going to have to be sorted out. It's uh, uh, the, look, Syria is not going to be a normal country, at least for the next 30 to 40 years. The, mm. Uh, mm. It may have won the, war but it will not win the peace for the next 30 to 40 years uh, so what you're saying it's a pirate victory <coughs> very much so yeah all right abhijit thank you very much for those thoughts and we will see how things lead in uh, in turkey and, and syria and kurdistan thank you very much thank you Thank you.